Those are some pretty tough acts to follow, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Um, Colleen helped me a lot because she illustrated one of um, several uh, initiatives going on in this part of the world uh, to show or illustrate um, how you can handle some of the nutrient management issues in the Lake Winnipeg Basin. Bob's presentation just, I mean, I summed it up right at the end with there's some urgency here. Uh, this is not something that people can sit around and debate or think about uh, for too much longer. And Norm, I think, was a really good segue for me in the sense that uh, the IJC is an organization that's been involved in this part of the world, although um, people here may not realize it, for, for quite a few decades and has had some sex successful involvement here. Let me just ask, before I go through this, uh, how many people in this room here know something or anything about the International Joint Commission and the Boundary Waters Treaty? Just, just show of hands. I want to get a... There's quite a few. Okay, well then, some of what I'm going to say may be repetitious for you, uh, maybe even a little bit boring, but um, I think it's important to understand um, what the organization's all about, uh, the international agreement under which it operates, a little bit about the work that it's done in this part of the world, and why um, I and the organization uh, that I'm part of, the Forum for Leadership on Water Flow, thinks that it could be um, a useful way of, of adding to, not replacing, but adding to all those good initiatives that are underway to help uh, Lake Winnipeg. So what is the International Joint Commission? I just want to make sure that everybody here, I'm going to do an IJC uh, 101. Okay, so the IJC is uh, made up of six commissioners, three appointed by the uh, Prime Minister, essentially. It's called the uh, Governor and Council, but essentially it's, it's a Prime Ministerial appointment, and three appointed by the President of the United States uh, with uh, the consent and approval of the Senate. The IJC is a is not a creature of government. It's independent because the treaty is a, is a separate treaty. It receives its funding from the Canadian and U.S. government uh, depart, uh, departments. In Canada, it's the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs. In the United States, it happens to be State Department. But once it receives that money, obviously aside from whatever accountability it has, it has the authority to use it as it sees fit under the treaty. Uh, it's a permanent body, which means uh, when it was established, uh, when the treaty was signed, and I'll explain that very briefly in 1909, uh, it has ongoing funding and exists in a permanent fashion. So it doesn't go away and come back like some uh, organizations that might be created temporarily to deal with issues. It's there and working uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days in a year. It has two secretariats, essentially, one in Ottawa, where I used to work, and one in Washington, D.C. Uh, it has another office in Windsor, Ontario, when the two governments signed something called the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in 1972. It gave the International Joint Commission the authority to manage that office, and it provides uh, resources and people to give advice to the commissioners about the implementation of the Water Quality Agreement. So that's why we say we have uh, three offices. The main work of the commission, because its staff is uh, very small, uh, the total staff in Ottawa and Washington together is about 25, 30 people, and it has roughly that many scientists and administrative staff in the, in the uh, Windsor office. So we're roughly about 50 bureaucrats. And again, there are six commissioners at the very top that they are the decision-making people. But the real heart of the uh, International Joint Commission, and one of the reasons why I think a reference would be uh, a useful addition to the governance that, and the work that's going on in this part of the world are the uh, special boards and task forces and other study groups that are established whenever the IJC uh, is, is doing a study or, as I'll explain, has some responsibility to oversee a structure uh, that's been built in, in Boundary Waters. And these groups are usually made up of, uh, they can be made up of public servants, in both countries. They can be made up of academia, 
Increasingly, they're being made up of members of the public who have time and interest uh, to be involved. And when you put that kind of a group together, the size varies, uh, the objective sometimes varies, certainly the structure and the way they work varies. But there, there's a few things that are germane to all of them that I think have demonstrated to me over the years that I've been there the real value of these, of these kinds of assignments. Number one, there's a, a growth of trust. Um, it doesn't happen overnight, and usually people who are selected are people who are, how can I say, better at working with, within a multi and interdisciplinary type of team. That's the kind of people that we, that we seek. And once we find them, of course, we tend to reappoint them to, uh, to different assignments. But the, the trust is really important. Uh, the other thing is that it, it provides a, a focal point uh, for work because, as, as we'll explain later, a reference is really a set of instructions uh, that both governments agree need to be undertaken. Very, very briefly, the commission that works under this treaty is given three basic roles. The first one is uh, what they call a quasi-judicial role, and that's not as tongue-tied as what Bob was trying to say about waves, but it's, it's hard enough sometimes. But um, if there's a structure that's going to be built in a boundary or transboundary water that affects water levels and flows, one of the approvals that the uh, applicant or proponent is supposed to obtain under the treaty is from the International Joint Commission. They don't necessarily have to get it from the IJC if the governments approve it separately. The applications have to come to the Commission through both governments, and then they're either approved or not approved. If they're approved, they're usually with conditions, and then the, uh, the project is usually monitored uh, by the Commission with the help of a, a control board. The second major role is this investigative advisory one, which is the one we're going to focus on here this evening, where under Article 9, or perhaps Article 4 of the treaty, governments will refer a matter to the IJC for uh, advice and recommendations. And uh, as it says there, they're, they're non-binding. Uh, but uh, over the years, because of the nature and the way in which the advice is generated and the uh, binational way in which the IJC works, the advice is usually considered quite authoritative from a scientific point of view. And also, uh, no one's ever worked out the batting average, but it's pretty high. Uh, and sometimes people think, oh, the IJC recommendations were never followed. And that's because in the water world, it sometimes takes a long time for governments and others to recognize the value of some recommendations which may not have been as obvious. Because when the commissioners get together and these boards work, one of the things they do is they, they, are, they are instructed to work in their personal and professional capacity. So if you're appointed from the Manitoba Department of Conservation or from the Minnesota Department of Water or Quality or whatever, you come with that knowledge, but you're asked to park your allegiance to those departments and agencies at the door and work in the interests of the people in the basin. And that doesn't always come very easily, but the, the commissioners are usually very good at lecturing and giving a really good kickoff to these kinds of uh, studies in such a way that the people who are selected to do the work actually, and I've seen this myself, so it may seem like a bit of a naivety, but it's, it does work. People will do this. They will become proponents for solutions that work in the interests of all people in a basin and not just from where they come from. They won't forget where they, where they are living and where they work, but they'll bring that information to the table and use it. This is one of the most powerful things that you can have in an IJC reference, which is quite different from having a series of, of initiatives that work in the various different jurisdictions separately and then come together and talk to each other at some point in time. I don't know if I'm expressing that clearly enough, but uh, it is really significant value of, of an IJC study. The last one, we won't spend hardly any time at all because there is an arbitration provision in the treaty it's never been used, so there's no sense talking about it. Um, I just wanted to show you the scope of the International Joint Commission. For those that are not familiar with it, that's the boundary area from one side of the 
continent to the other from west to east or east to west you guys are right in the middle so um, but it's interesting because I don't have the statistics in my head I don't remember them now but there's of the 300 odd rivers that either form or cross the boundary there's a considerable number I think more go from Canada into the United States but there are still quite a few significant ones that go from the United States into Canada of course we're the Red River being one of the most significant right here and there are some that crisscross back and forth there are obviously others that form the boundary so uh, when we're talking about uh, the IJC being formed by the Boundary Waters Treaty um, for those that want to study it a little more there's a little booklet that the IJC puts out that explains uh, some of the main features of it and what is really intriguing for a treaty uh, it's a very plainly written document uh, it's not convoluted, it's not hard to understand. What is challenging sometimes is to do it interpreting the words of the treaty. For example, um, well, let's wait till we get there. But this wonderful fellow over there is not me in my earlier life. It happens to be the leading author of the treaty, a gentleman by the name of Sir George Gibbons, who was a lawyer from London, Ontario. And I just put him up there to give a human face to, to the document. The interesting thing is, this is a treaty that's been around over a hundred years. Ideas for this treaty began, there's a whole, actually there might be a book coming out about this, but uh, it started in the late 1800s, the idea for a treaty between Canada and the United States, because you just simply had to look at the geography of the country and see all these rivers and lakes and streams that either form the boundary or cross the boundary many times. And people were getting the idea that wouldn't it be nice if we had some institutional way of dealing with problems as they arose. In the early 1900s, there were two significant problems in the country. The one on the left shows the uh, construction methods of the day for digging a canal in the St. Mary and Mel Canal, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Montana, and so on. And there was, that's, I don't have a map, but if, if I did, and if you want to look at it later, you'll see where uh, water originates in Montana, flows into Alberta, then the St. Mary's, uh, does this and then the Milk River comes and crosses the boundary then goes back into the United States and flows right down to the to the bottom of the United States the problems were how do you how do you divide this water up between uh, the, the jurisdictions that were interested in using it for irrigation the one on the right is uh, has to do with the allocation of water at Niagara Falls where there was considerable amount of water for power generation and and it it's pretty obvious now what happened, but at the time, solutions were not easy to find. Anyway, in developing solutions to these two particular problems, the notion of a much broader uh, treaty uh, really came into being. So when they signed the treaty, they actually developed an apportionment mechanism for, for uh, dividing up the waters of the St. Mary and Milk rivers, and they uh, wrote an article in the treaty for how to manage and divide up the water for power and for scenic purposes in, in Niagara. So, um, I've already explained the origin really came about because of those two specific problems, but because there was some general thought going on in conferences and in other places in the, in the governments that there should be some kind of an overarching institution and a treaty that would guide uh, everything. The interesting thing is uh, the scope of this is really more than just boundary waters. Uh, it talks about it because it's called the Boundary Waters Treaty. But if you look at the various articles, um, and I, although they did not use the word, the word environment, ecosystem, sustainable development doesn't appear in the treaty anywhere. The word pollution does, and even that was really ahead of its time. But it, it actually is a treaty that can deal with any kind of environmental issue. It's dealt primarily with water. It's dealt somewhat with air and fish. Um, and it's dealt, it's dealt with land use but it could, in theory, be used to solve a trade dispute. It never has, probably never will, because after a hundred years, the scope of it has pretty well been determined by governments. So, the basic purpose of the treaty, and the basic purpose of the IJC, is to prevent and resolve disputes. Okay, four words, prevent and resolve disputes. And that's, sometimes, it's easier said than done. Uh, prevention means getting ahead of the game, Resolving them means trying to find solutions after the problems exist. And I was at the commission for both ends of that. Uh, it's a lot easier to prevent 
uh, than it is to resolve. Because by the time it came to us for resolution, positions were often very hardened and difficult uh, to resolve. The treaty contains a whole bunch of very important principles which I won't go through, but I thought just to give you a flavor for what it's like, it talks about something which is, I'll say this in front of a, an audience filled with my U.S. colleagues, equal and similar use. Where else but under this treaty? There are very few uh, things in Canada and the United States that gives Canada, which in a roughly sense is one-tenth the size and importance of the United States, equal and similar rights. The Boundary Waters Treaty is one of the very few things that does that in an existing and permanent institution. So think about that for a minute. Whenever you get together with the United States, they have a lot more clout than we do. And this was back in the day when you could sign such a thing. I think you'd be thinking you'd been smoking something real hard if you thought you could get something like this through the United States today. There is absolutely no way where the United States would sign a treaty with Canada giving us equal and similar rights in boundary waters or anything else for that matter. It also, at the time, uses of water were different than they are today. They were very concerned with sanitary and domestic use. That, was the, that had the highest priority. Uh, navigation was a big issue throughout the country, uh, in, in both countries. Uh, power generation, I mentioned Niagara, so that was on their mind. And, and irrigation. There was no mention of recreational use. There was no mention of the environment. There was no mention of, of ecosystem at all. But what has happened is, because the IJC and the treaty is written in such a way that it can be interpreted and reinterpreted, that's what has happened. So even though circumstances change, society has changed dramatically between 1909 and 2014. I'm not even going to bother telling you because we all know that. Um, it, the, the treaty is still there and it's still, it's still useful uh, in terms of uh, as a guide when you get a reference or for any other work that the IJC has to do. But what is really important is the language allows it to be interpreted for the condition under which it's uh, uh, being used. Um, and the last one I highlight because when our organization, our small group of people in Flow, uh, were looking for important issues upon which we could make some statements, Lake Winnipeg certainly was one of them. As Norm mentioned, uh, the amount of water that comes into Lake Winnipeg from the Red River, the amount of nutrients that come in, suggested to us and told us really that if you were to if you were to be honest about it article 4 of the treaty which says this is my language not the exact language of the treaty there must not be injury to property uh, on either side of the border as a result of pollution and what we saw is that that's what's happening that's really what's happening in Lake Winnipeg more nutrients are coming in from the United States and it's polluting Lake Winnipeg. However, that's not a very diplomatic way to go about uh, working with your, with your U.S. colleagues. So we thought, is there another way in which you could tackle this problem and do it in a way which is like a win-win win scenario? And that is, uh, how can it be presented in a way that it's, it's not your fault and we're going to gain if something is done, but can we work on this all together so that there are benefits for everybody uh, in the process? And there you look at a different part of the treaty than Article 4, which is a violation of a treaty, and you say under Article 9, it's more like a basin planning exercise, where you say, you have problems, we have problems, can we sit down together and see if we can figure out how we can solve these problems in the best interests of citizens of everybody within the basin? When you take that approach, you get quite a different um, way of looking at things, I hope, and I'll, make, I'll try to make the case that if you use Article 9 of the Boundary Waters Treaty, you could draft a reference which I think would be beneficial for as many people in Minnesota and North Dakota as they would be for people in Manitoba. People in North Dakota and Minnesota may not agree with me, but I, I think you could make uh, a decent enough case for it. So, what actually is an IJC reference? Well, you, you can read what I, what I have up there. But I think um, Norm circulated one of the drafts that I did um, that contain language. Basically, it's a set of instructions 
uh, that the Commission would receive from both governments simultaneously. Now, for students of the IJC and the Boundary Waters Treaty, they will know that the treaty actually provides for unilateral references. In other words, if Manitoba wanted to send a reference and work with the government of Canada through, say, foreign affairs, they could draft a reference and send it to us. In fact, there were many people arguing that that's what they should have done on Devil's Lake when they were vitally worried about uh, what could happen if, if, um, uh, if there were outlets at Devil's Lake that would contain contaminants coming here into Lake Winnipeg. But the history is such that the Commission has never received a unilateral reference. I'm just going to go down a slight tangent and explain why that, in my opinion, that probably wouldn't work. As I've already said, the IJC works collegially with people from both countries, from, from different disciplines and from different departments. If you only had a request from one government and not the other, how likely would it be that you would get the cooperation from the other government that didn't want to join in the reference to provide the data, information, funding, and any other resources that you would need to do the work. It would be very difficult, if not impossible. If they were not willing at the outset to pose the questions that they wanted answers to, the chances of getting the resources and all the other things that you would need to do a study are pretty slim. That's why I say unilateral references are probably a bad idea. On the other hand, I've met academics who can put a case forward for it, so I won't say it's impossible. But like I said, we've never received one. So that's why I say they're received from both governments simultaneously. And what that signals is that bureaucrats who negotiate these things within the State Department in the United States and Foreign Affairs in Canada, they've come to some agreement on, a, on two major things. Number one, what is the issue and what are the answers that we want the IJC to give us? And the second thing, of course, I just said is that the IJC. The International Joint Commission is but one tool in the diplomatic toolbox that governments have to use. Just because there's a treaty, and just because the IJC has been sitting there for 100 years and had some success, doesn't necessarily mean it's the best tool to pick up. You all know, because you do jobs around the house, or you, sometimes there's more than one tool. I happen to believe that the tool called the IJC is a very useful tool. It's cheap to use, uh, and I'll explain that in a minute, and it's very effective, and it's had a lot of success. But in certain cases, it, it may not be the, you know, the favored one. So, uh, let's just talk about a reference is a set of instructions, and the, the result of a reference is some kind of written product. It's almost always in the form of a report. And um, over 100 years, I could point to a lot of them, but I just picked a few of the more Whoops, recent ones. I didn't want to go that fast. Going from top left there, that's one that uh, emanated from the one in the middle and the bottom called the IJC in the 21st century. After uh, almost 100 years of operation, the governments came to us and said, you guys have done some really good work over the first 100 years. What do you see as happening on the horizon in the next 100 years, and how would you, what would you do to change things so that you could be as effective as possible? Well, this was a different kind of reference because it didn't deal with a project going good or bad. It didn't deal with basin planning like I'm talking about here for Lake Winnipeg. It dealt with ourselves when I was there. It said, you are an institution. What can you do to improve yourself? Well, the, the commission held meetings and hearings across the country. It talked to a lot of different people and put out that report called the IJC in the 21st century. There were five recommendations, but the one that was most important was their creation that resulted in the creation of international watershed boards. Um, at the time, and to some extent even now, when the IJC creates a board, it's, it's, it has a very specific objective. Most of its boards were either focused on water quality or water quantity. Very few were focused on both, and hardly any were focused on taking a broader ecosystem approach. And this is a result of the first hundred years of operation and the way in which the Commission was asked to work. Well, under this new idea, and the report up in the top left is a report about watershed boards to the governments, there was this notion that we should take an ecosystem approach. That stemmed from that report, and that's what that report is all about. And then the governments came back, and they asked us this question in 1997, I think, 
And uh, then they gave back, came back and gave us a permanent reference that said, would you please start to establish these boards and let us know which one the first one will be and give us regular updates and so on and so forth. And so that's an, uh, that's an ongoing reference. It's an example of a reference but a different kind, more related to us. It's very important in this basin because the International Watershed Initiative is what is providing a lot of funding for one of the boards that I'm going to talk about, the International Red River Board, to do some of the work that's on nutrients and, uh, and like Winnipeg. Uh, I, the, the one on the right hand side there had to do with diversions and removals of water from the Great Lakes. There was a big furor over a tanker that was going to take water out of Lake, Lake Superior. The Commission took about a year to come up with a whole series of recommendations on how the governments of Canada and the United States should protect the waters of the Great Lakes. A very significant report, but it, it, it resulted in uh, giving good advice to the government of Canada in particular on a bill called Bill C-6, uh, which had to do with diversions uh, and removals of water from, uh, um, from that body of water. 